we have been working to increase recycling, reuse, repair, repurposing and reduction of waste. The Isles of Scilly Waste Reduction Strategy commits to working with residents, businesses and organisations to reduce the volume of waste across the islands. Cornwall Council is supporting projects that encourage people to reduce their waste. These include the award-winning Repair Cafe Network and the Sort It campaign, asking people to sort their rubbish before visiting the household waste site so that more is recycled. We help people to compost at home, run waste reduction and recycling campaigns and are working to improve reuse from our household waste and recycling centres. There's further to go, but we can all play our part. Well, we only have one planet. Um, this is our home and behave in a responsible manner towards it. We have enough resources on the planet to, without having to make anything new. It could be a chance that my house is going to be underwater in 30 years' time. Reduce our consumption of things. We can repair things that are broken. We can rewear clothes that are unloved. We don't have to make anything new anymore. We run lots of community projects from our community swish, which is once a month. That's a, a clothes swap party. We also run a repair cafe once a month. So the repair cafe is a massive way where you can cut down on your carbon footprint immediately by getting involved with the Repair Café. We also offer a variety of upcycling workshops. We also run from Upcycle Kernel, we're part of the TerraCycle Recycling Scheme and that's a hard to recycle plastics that you can't put in your curbside. Um, so yeah, so as a community group if you want to start something you can come to us for the information and we can give you that information so that you can start that as well. Um, businesses really need to be supported to be able to actually do some recycling without it costing them a fortune. By recycling more, by reducing our consumption and uh, repairing things and uh, refilling bottles is that we're actually saving loads of money personally. So I suppose some of the barriers that we come across are when we're trying to develop innovative solutions for repurposing waste, there's a lot of different barriers that are put in place in terms of regulations on how you can and can't reuse materials. So it's working around solutions for how can regulations support reuse. We're just at the point of manufacturing now a water refill station. These plumb into southwest water mains and provide the public with access to free drinking water. Cornwall Council have got this ambitious aim to become net zero by 2030 and our project can contribute to that. And we know that 8,000 tonnes of plastic go into the sea every year. Cornwall Council are funding 15 of these units fully sited, so that gives us 15 opportunities to collaborate with communities. Living on the Isles of Scilly, you know, we're, we're really lucky to live somewhere so beautiful and it's important, you know, that it can can stay beautiful for future generations and um, you know we don't want to see our beaches you know strewn with plastic in the future and ensure that sea levels don't rise so much that the place eventually uh, disappears. We do all, all the basics, all the recycling that you'd expect and stuff and we use all recyclable packaging and all our cups and our salad pots and things like that are all biodegradable and also we incentivize people to reuse um, coffee cups by offering a reduced price on hot drinks for reusable cups. The main thing that we do and we're really proud of is our refill zone which is behind me, which is um, the way that we um, let people shop for um, your basics like grains and nuts and seeds and dried fruit and herbs and spices and everything um, in, a, in a kind of plastic free way. So they can either bring a reusable container in and we'll fill it up for them over and over again. It helps reduce waste both in packaging, but also food waste, which is important too. I would encourage consumers to try and shop more ethically and, and in a more sustainable way by, by coming to places where they can uh, use less plastic and, and, and reuse their containers and things like that. Well, good morning and welcome to the resources session of today's event. 
Over the next 50 minutes or so, we'll be listening to uh, two speakers. One is uh, Professor Stefan Bohm, who is in Glasgow at the moment, but he is normally the professor in organization and sustainability at the University of Exeter Business School. We'll also be hearing from Dawn Thompson, who is a, the local advocate here in Cornwall, uh, in relation to resources and is involved with an organization called Upcycling Kerno and uh, a community interest company based in Portreath. Well, uh, as you probably realize, our speakers cannot cover everything in the available time, but uh, hope it may stimulate our thinking about resources. So over to you, Professor Bone. Thanks very much, Steve. Thanks for having me and hello to Cornwall from Glasgow, where I'm currently attending COP26, the Global Climate Change Conference. Uh, I normally live near Truro in Cornwall and I work on the uh, Penryn University campus. Now, planet Earth is under a huge amount of strain. Many scientists I talk to here at COP26 fear that staying below two degrees of global warming since the Industrial Revolution is really wishful thinking at best. They think that we probably need to prepare ourselves more for like four to five degrees warming, which, which is a huge rise that we have to prepare for. Uh, carbon trading, carbon offsetting was introduced at COP3 uh, in Kyoto 1997. Um, that, that's one of the solutions that was put forward all the way back then. Yes, the world has um, really made a lot of progress. For example, we've lived through a renewable energy revolution, um, but these renewables have not really displaced fossil fuels. For 30 years, we have talked about climate change at the highest possible political level. If you watch YouTube clips uh, from the 1992 Earth Summit, I, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember, remember that quite vividly. That took place in Rio de Janeiro. And so when you watch these clips, you realize that all this time ago, um, uh, you know, the, the, the global leaders already knew that climate change is real and, and urgent. So that was you know, 30 years ago. So what have we achieved in 30 years of climate talks? I'm afraid to say not really enough, or, or you know, some, critics, some critics would say almost nothing, because the global emissions curves are all showing in the wrong direction. Yes, the global pandemic has brought down emissions in some countries by up to 10%, but we're currently experiencing the mother of all rebounds, and in many countries, the emissions are already back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, we have to remember that we don't just live through a climate crisis. There's a freshwater crisis, there's a bee crisis, there's a species extinction crisis. There's even a fruit orchard crisis. There's a plastics in the ocean crisis, as we just heard. Uh, there's an ocean acidification crisis. There's a coral reef crisis. There's a fish stock crisis. I could go on and on. These are interlinked crises that all uh, need to be addressed. Planet Earth is bleeding under the strain of extractive, polluting, mindless human activity. I'm afraid that's not all. Our societies and economies are broken too. The gap between those who have a lot and those who have next to nothing is getting wider and wider. We can see that all too clearly in Cornwall. Those who own hotels, caravans, Airbnb flats, uh, or those who have retired here are well off. But the bulk of the working population who work in hospitality, tourism, agriculture, fishing, transport, etc., social care, very important in Cornwall, they can often barely uh, make ends meet. So, and inflation at the moment is, is currently going through the roof. And affordable housing has essentially become non-existent in Cornwall. There are many lives wasted, so many skills and opportunities wasted. The economy is often too hierarchical and pre works predominantly for, for those few at the top, those with property, with land, with professional expertise. 
But here we're talking about material resources in this session. And from that point of view, the picture is not much better. The UK economy material footprint is around 22 tonnes per capita. It's a huge amount. And this includes all the stuff that we are importing, which we mustn't forget. Estimates say that the UK carbon footprint, for example, is about 30% higher if we account for all the carbon embodied in the stuff that we are importing on an annual basis. The current system will see an increase in our material footprint year by year, even under the scenario where all companies apply a high resource efficiency paradigm. Why is that? Because the efficiency gains will be simply outstripped by increasing growth. So economic growth is really at the heart of what we're talking about here. And that's the story for carbon emissions too. Economic growth is directly correlated to greenhouse gas emissions. There hasn't really been a global decoupling between economic growth and greenhouse gas emissions. We waste resources at an unprecedented scale. For example, less than 5% of all plastics in Southwest England are recycled. That's only 5%. The rest is lost or burned or ends up in our bodies or in, in, in other animals. Most likely they end up in our rivers or eventually in the sea. My colleague, Peter Hopkinson from the University of Exeter gave me another insightful statistic. Approximately 75 million pounds worth of plastic material flows out of the Southwest economy every year and is lost after only one uh, life cycle. And it's just plastics. What about all the other materials? Take food waste, for example. Paul Martin, who heads the waste team uh, for the council, confirmed to me that food waste is one of the, if not the biggest problem in Cornwall, where we, of course, rely a lot on hospitality in the tourism sector. Basically, in our black bins at home and, and what our SMEs waste and throw away, there are tons and tons of food on a daily basis. And unfortunately, a lot of it is uneaten. And that's not even accounting for the food that rots in our fields because it cannot enter the supply chain. This really makes no economic, no social, and no environmental sense. We are literally giving away millions of pounds worth of materials because we don't have the systems in place to reuse them, to remanufacture re them, or recycle them, or even simply use them in the first place as. Uh, you know, the carrots grown in the field, that's their, that's their purpose, that's their intention of growing carrots. The current economy, I'm afraid to say, is often designed to be hugely wasteful. And all of this has immense climate change implications, as every material has an embodied carbon footprint and is transported around as a virtual material, then as a manufactured product, and then eventually as waste. So what can we actually do about this? We literally need to design a new economic system. We need to design economic and social relations in such a way that human and material waste does not occur in the first place. Materials need to be circled within closed loops for as long as possible. Every material, whether that's a carrot or a piece of cardboard or even a brick, every material that is not in use anymore needs to re-enter um, another loop of use. And that makes complete economic sense as we're currently seeing in the global supply chain crisis in almost all material categories. If, if there's a shortage of stuff, as we often experience at the moment, people will have to learn to, to source things locally and reuse them um, uh, locally. A circular economy would also have immense social benefits. Thousands of jobs could be created in Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly in a new resource reuse and remanufacture industry. Do we need to ship e-waste up country because we cannot do anything with it in our region? No, we don't, because that value is just lost. We need to reuse material that's already in Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. If this all sounds a bit abstract, then let me just give you a few examples of what we're already doing in Cornwall in the Isles of Scilly to make our county, county more circular, moving towards a, a redesigned 
uh, economy. First, let me use this example uh, of Tevi uh, having been involved. Uh, Tevi is a program of circular economy and environmental growth um, that's running in Cornwall. And we have worked with a company called C, uh, ZLC Energy on a hydrogen project. Uh, while the UK has driven down carbon emissions of the power sector quite a lot, transport and housing uh, is still desperately inefficient with a very high carbon footprint. So Teddy has been working with ZLC to create green hydrogen out of Cornwall's unused renewable energy. Because uh, in Cornwall, we have often grid, grid shortages. So a lot of renewable energy that is generated in Cornwall is not being used. So this needs to be uh, turned into green hydrogen to, to power our lorries and buses, for example. And it can also be fed into the existing uh, gas house, household system. And that makes particular sense for a rural county like Cornwall in the uh, Arts of Scilly. Secondly, let me mention another project that Pevy has been involved in with. Uh, so seagrasses are very important uh, from an ecosystem's point of view. Uh, they provide habitat for many threatened marine species. Um, they're also important for nursery environments, for commercially important fish, and they capture, capture carbon as well. So traditional mooring systems are often the greatest threats, threats to these endangered habitats. So as part of uh, Tevi, we've been working with harbors, mooring providers, and boat users, and conservationists as well to design advanced mooring systems that reduce these impacts. And that makes complete sense because you know, tourism and the marine industries play such an important role for, for Cornwall. We have also worked with uh, Boost, which is an innovative product in the healthcare sector, uh, essentially uh, designing breast forms, something that is not often talked about. Uh, Tevi funded the production of prototypes for their breathable and beautiful breast forms from waste silicon, a material that uh, often uses a lot of resources in its manufacture. And it's a great example of how sustainable products can be also good for people's well-being. Um, and just one last example from outside Cornwall, which was provided to me kindly by my colleague Fiona Charnley. Um, so two days ago here in Glasgow, I saw for the first time uh, the River Simple car. Um, it's a car company. River Simple is that car company with a difference. It's, it's based in rural Wales and is the world's only independent hydrogen car company. And it's, it's working on a circular uh, business model basis. Um, they're probably the only car company in the world that never want to sell a single car because they are actually uh, working on a subscription model. So you have to subscribe to, to the River Simple car and it's an open source design. It's using distributive uh, manufacturing principles, very much supporting the local economy in, in rural Wales. So it's just an example of a circular business model that uh, works really well, particularly in, in rural settings. And there's no reason why we can't do something similar in, in, in Cornwall. Tevi is already working with hundreds of companies to help them transition to a circular economy. And let me finally highlight that this is not simply a, a question for business, uh, businesses and the entire uh, business sector. Entire villages, towns, and cities need to become more circular as well. We could, for example, have industrial com composters of food waste in every tourism and hospitality hotspot in Cornwall. This would create compost that goes straight back onto the field, producing veg for cafes and restaurants, selling the food back to the uh, uh, customers. We need to source our food locally, and we need to produce the necessary nutrients for our agricultural production locally. This requires collaboration between policymakers like from the council, cross businesses, but also from civil society. Uh, and, and let me just talk a little bit about the Isles of Scilly. As an island community, they're really at the front line of the need to become more circular because the waste can't really go anywhere. So island communities are well-placed to 
uh, to champion circular economy uh, approaches. And some of that is already going on on, on the Alts of City, which is, which is great. Um, but on the mainland as well, there are many towns and villages at the, at the end of the line, so to speak, with one road in and one road out. Falmouth is one example, very near where I live. You've got a very busy A39. What if this road breaks down? Falmouth would literally be cut off. So how can we keep resources in Falmouth? How can we put stuff on the existing train branch line? How can we create a more circular Falmouth? There are many opportunities the circular economy provides. We need to really grab them now because the, the, the crises that I talked about earlier are very urgent. So let me just finish by saying this. Early on, I talked about four to five degrees of global warming that we need to prepare for, potentially. I hope not, but that's potentially what we have to prepare for. That sounds pretty abstract, right? But under this scenario, many parts of the planet will actually become, become uninhabitable. There would be mass species dying at an unprecedented scale. We would struggle to feed the world's population. Sea level rises would make many coastal levels sink into the sea. Hundreds of millions of people would be displaced. Droughts and other extreme weather events would become the norm. And that's not even accounting for the unforeseeable tipping points in the global climate system that could switch to a completely new state altogether. So I don't think we've seen anything yet. So we have no time to lose, really. And Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly will be at the front line of climate change, given our exposure to the elements. Planet Earth will undoubtedly survive. There's no doubt about that. There will be planet Earth, but whether humankind will be so lucky remains to be seen. So let's make this switch. Let's save the carbon. Let's implement circular economy principles and make a much more sustainable Cornwall. So thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much for that, Professor uh, Stefan Byrne. That was really, really interesting. And uh, our next speaker is, um, is Dawn Thompson. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, she's a local advocate for um, two resources, and particularly upcycling. In fact, runs a company called, or an organization rather, called Upcycling Kerno, based in Portree. And um, so I invite Dawn now to say something more about it. Hi, nice to meet you both. Hi, um, so my name's Dawn Thompson. I am I'm the founder and project leader of a community interest company in Portreath called Upcycle Kernel. Um, we are a group of volunteers who come together and have created a community hub, which is all about reuse. So anything to do with um, recycling, um, reusing items, refilling items, repairing items. Um, we run a variety of different projects that can cover um, lots of these different things. Um, I wanted to pick up on a couple of things that um, that Stefan talked about. Um, and it really resonates, the, the things that he said about, uh, about, about Cornwall, you know, we're the end of the line down here. Um, and it, it's really true that we really need to think about how we can... Um, use all of the resources that we have in our beautiful county and in the islands at, at, at the end um, to to make sure that, that yeah, like Stefan says, we don't really need to be putting out 75 million pounds worth of um, uh, materials to send them out of the country. I do feel on uh, from a business point of view um, and from an economic point of view, um, the southwest, certainly Cornwall, could probably do with its very own recycling plant down here that deals specifically with plastics. The um, plastics were designed to be recycled, um, and it's a shame that we're not doing as much as we can to reuse those, those resources. It could be a really useful um, resource. Um, there are different schemes. Um, Cornwall Council only take a few different things from the curbside um, 
but there are other recycling schemes that you can take part in. So there's the TerraCycle recycling scheme and uh, this is we're a public drop off point at um, Upcycle Care and all for different types of plastics. And that's anything from kids toys um, to crisp packets to spondex gloves, marigold gloves, bread bags. So there's there's things that the, the public can do on their plastic consumption um, to make sure that what they are actually buying in and they can take some responsibility there. They can look at a product, decide whether they want to buy it um, and really relate, sorry, look at its uh, packaging and decide, can I do something with that packaging when I get home? Can it go on my curbside? Can I send it to TerraCycle or does it have to go in the rubbish bin? Because if it's going in the rubbish bin, we shouldn't be buying it. So yeah, TerraCycle is just one of those things where we can um, look at recycling more and more plastics. And um, there are other schemes available and certainly Upcycle Kernel is going to be looking into a few of those over the next couple of months. So I can't say too much about them at the moment. Um, yeah, um, one of the big things that we do at, um, from Upcycle Kernel and one of the big th things that, that um, the general public can do is um, take part in a repair cafe. So this is something that started off in the Netherlands um, 14, 15 years ago and proved to be a really good success and has spread throughout the world. Often they run in conjunction with uh, libraries of things or tool libraries. So the materials, that, um, the items that are brought in to be fixed, there are um, there is equipment or tools to actually do the repairing with. The only thing that's needed then in that case is the skills and that's where volunteers come in um, and certainly our repair cafe is run entirely by volunteers and um, the people who bring their broken things pay a small donation and that goes towards paying for things like insurance and um, to hire the building that we use and those sorts of things it's not a money-making venture by any stretch and um, so they're really really successful and you can set up your own repair cafe um, just by either contacting ourselves at Upcycle Kernel, we can give you the information on how you can do that. Or actually, there is a Cornwall Repair Cafe network, um, and you can you can also contact them. Um, and we're part of that network, um, and they'll um, again give you all the documentation you need to set one up, disclaimers, um, how how to operate, um, risk assessments, because they're always a fear factor with people when it comes to running something like a repair cafe. We can tell you where to go to get your insurance um, and we can share our network of volunteer fixers as well, which is, you know, that's something that's really, really important. Um, uh, yeah, another thing that, that you can do on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, uh, a household level is you can attend a swish. And a swish is a clothes swap party. They're great fun. Um, and uh, clothes swap parties, again, have been around for a long, long time. Um, and it's a great way to not only move on the clothes that you've been hoarding in your wardrobe that are unloved, um, you can move them on, you can take them there. Somebody else is going to love them. Um, and meet new people who um, are like-minded, uh, share lots of ideas, um, you know, get a new wardrobe. Um, of clothes while you're passing on the ones that you're no, lo no longer using um, it's a great way we find as well there's a lot of communities who really need these events and um, clothing for some people like Stefan said earlier the gap between um, between people in Cornwall is really 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 apparent I and mean, there are families who cannot afford to, to clothe to clothe their kids um, so clothes swap parties again are another really great way of saving money um, but also being able to, to get new clothes. Um, and it, it's one of those things, but things like the repair cafes and things like the swishes, they break the, they don't break the poverty trap by any stretch of the imagination, but they certainly mentally take the pressure off. And that can only be good for your mental health. There is somewhere where you can go to um, to get the kids some new clothes for the weekend, you know, when they if they need something to go to the park in. There is somewhere where you can update their school uniforms if they've got a hole in the knee. You can bring them in and either get, re get them repaired or swap them at the swish for another pair. You know, there are these really simple grassroots um, projects that people can get involved in that A, are going to help towards cutting down on the carbon footprint in a massive way and B, going to save them money and C, they're going to meet new people um, with, with like-minded um, thoughts and create a community within Cornwall that really does think about repairing, sharing, re-loving their items. Um, and I think that's, that's a very important 
thing. Um, a lot of communities, um, the the language that's used um, by especially the politicians and the news readers and everything else, and and sorry as well, professors like yourself, Stephen, you so well um, qualified to talk on these things. But when when it trickles down to the communities, they don't understand what you're talking about. They don't understand what 22 tons of carbon footprint means. They don't understand what it means to to capture carbon and and they don't so they don't think they can do anything about it because they don't understand the language but through things like swishes and repair cafes they can do something about it at a language that they can understand and in a way that they can get involved um i don't know an awful lot about food waste because it's not my forte but i do know there are gleaning um groups that you can get involved with with um who actually go out into the fields and take those veggies that aren't the correct shape for the supermarket um and there are community groups starting to spring up that will redirect these foods um but one of the big things that we're finding i find this not only within upcycled kernel but i also find this um this problem with another um community uh project that we run called text innovation which deals in circular economy and how we can repurpose waste on an industrial and a commercial level. Um, and the problem that these we have, as uh, Stefan pointed out, is uh, we have these innovative solutions for reuse, but they've got such strict regulations and such strict restrictions behind them that um, the food is being wasted because it's one day out of date. Well, a cabbage doesn't grow with an out of date date stamped on it. Um, and, you know, a piece of clothing, it's only fashionable in the eyes of somebody else. Um, there, there are so many things that we can do. And a lot of it is about changing mindsets and stopping this, um, this old idea of keeping up with the Joneses and having to buy everything new. And it's all about the biggest TV and the flashiest jacket. And we, we, we have to stop thinking like that because, A, it's costing our planet. And B, it's costing our pocket. We've got to pay for that. If we don't have to pay for these things, then we can step back out of the hamster wheel a little bit more and actually enjoy what's around us and actually have 10 minutes to um, put a new zip into a pair of trousers or to grow some veggies in the garden. We need to take a step back and really think about how we live and what we can do to change lots of things. And yes, people will look at you and think, well, she's a bit weird. She's grown her own carrots in there. But actually, I've saved lots of money by, by growing carrots. I've helped my, my um, uh, uh, the space that I have uh, uh, there to uh, become... Uh, to become useful rather than it just growing grass. Yeah, there are things that we can do um, to, to make sure that we can live in a society that helps our planet and is more circular without it becoming a, um, a, a really scary thing that the public don't understand. Yeah, um, there's lots of things that we can do. I think um, we can redirect sources. I think businesses could do with a lot more support on um, where they can redirect their recycling. And certainly, um, if there was more options for businesses to recycle, we'll take things through TerraCycle from businesses as well. Um, but through the council recycling schemes, uh, there does need to be a lot of help to businesses to be able to recycle their things. And I think a lot of businesses could look at their waste and think about how they can be repurposed as well. For example, there's a... Um, there's a group called PackShare that um, swaps packaging and boxes. Um, so you don't have to pack all your boxes off and send them off for recycling. Now you can pop them on PackShare and somebody will want them. Um, think about the pallets. Um, if they're non-returnable pallets, then there's probably a group of people somewhere, um, maybe at Upcycle Kernel, who know how to uh, repurpose those pallets and can teach you the skills um, use the tools from the tool library in the repair cafe to teach you the skills to how you can use these resources in your own life. Um, I'm not sure how much time I've got left, <laughs> so I don't know if either Stefan or Steve want to pop in at any of these points while I'm chattering away here. Um, yeah, uh, so yes, yeah, so I think there is lots that we can do. Um, and yes, yeah, is, is there any questions or anything that anybody has so far? 
Yes, thank, thank you very much, Dawn. That was really, really good. And um, interestingly enough, I'm over in Portreef in a week or so's time. So I'll uh, I'll bring my washing machine with me and look into it. <laughs> well, funnily yeah. enough, we have a repair coming up on the uh, 21st of November in Portreef um, from 11 till 2. Um, so, yes, we're looking for volunteers to come in as volunteer fixers. But, yeah, we'll be looking for items to fix once we've got those fixes. It'd be great to see you there. Yep, okay. Well, we do have some questions. In fact, the first one, you, you've partially answered already in, in the last statement you made. But the questions come through is, uh, what can Cornwall Council do to encourage the businesses of Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly to reduce the plastic, particularly single use presented to customers? Any thoughts, but either of you or both of you? Personally, I believe single-use plastics should be banned um, or at least uh, uh, sold at such a level um, that people will want to return them rather than just chucking them in the bin. Um, it's a bit of a... Yeah, I'll let Stefan answer that. <laughs> well, it's, it's a difficult one because obviously there's a role for central government to legislate about plastic. And there was another question, I think, in the chat about exactly that what's the role of uk government and there's a big role for legislation on these issues you know we can't leave it to individual customers to constantly make these kind of choices when they go to a supermarket or elsewhere there's really important um, action that every individual can take but you know as we've seen with the plastic bag issue in supermarkets you know that issue was taken out of the equation almost overnight because uh UK government, central government, moved in to do something about it. So, so we, you know, central government legislation is very important. Um, just a point on 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 the. Um, I totally agree with you, Dawn, that in you know, communities are very very important to actually bring uh, circular economy issues right down to to the level of the community. Uh, so these repair cafes that you talked about are fantastic. They should really exist in every little village, town, and 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 hamlet. Even uh, I had yeah, three washing, I had three washing machines break down on me over the last three years. They were all they were all re uh, reused from from previous use. So I haven't bought a new washing machine for a long time. But unfortunately, they break, and sometimes just one single thing that's wrong with it, and I don't have the expertise to do something about it. So, um, so it'd be fantastic to have these regular centres where people can repair their stuff. Um, but of course, central government needs to legislate to really make these items more uh, repairable in the first place, and 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 that's really important. Absolutely, we we I know the um, the. The European um, uh, repair cafes pushed really hard, and a lot of the British ones as, as did as well, um, for the right to repair our items. Because a lot of people don't actually realise that when you buy um, specifically technical items, for example, mobile phones, um, and you smash a screen, um, you're within the contract with that mobile phone provider that you can't replace the screen. So in some ways, um, you know, legislation needs to be changed so that um, you access to the parts. Is, is available um, and access to the tools to be able to take the phones apart or to take the technical equipment apart is available. Um, because yes, the, it is possible that we can change them, but um, these providers sometimes withhold the tools to do it and um, all the parts to do it. And that needs to change, definitely. Yeah, I quite agree with that. Now, the next question is actually, um, I know Dawn mentioned she's not a, um, an expert in food waste, but the, the next question is about food waste. Um, I have heard mixed messages about TerraCycle, recycling, crisp packets, etc. What are the panel thoughts? Well, okay. Well, so, uh, personally, we we are a, um, a, a, a public drop-off point for TerraCycle, and that is um, crisp packets and. Um, Oh, there's all sorts of different streams that we take. There's about 18 that we take, collect all together. Now, each of these streams, it has the TerraCycle have put pressure on um, the the 
manufacturers themselves to actually pay for these schemes to run. So, for example, uh, Walkers actually sponsor the Crisp Packet one, KP sponsor the um, the Snacks Packet, Marigold um, sponsors the Bread Bags. There's uh, two different Warburton's Bread Bag schemes, Hovis sponsor another one, et cetera, et cetera. They're very, very brand specific because they are the people who are paying for the service. Um, now, one of the good things about TerraCycle that, that we took upon, looked at um, when we joined up three years ago was the fact that they were only offering this um, any monetary value from it to come through to community groups or to, uh, to charities or to schools. Now, that means that that kept the money out from our point of view. It kept the money um, uh, in, in Cornwall, um, as Stefan said, you know, it keeps keeps the money supporting the, the group that is actually collecting the things. It also stops that um, item becoming such a commodity on the open market, which is what has happened now with the supermarkets taking the plastic. Um, with TerraCycle, you can follow the trail of the plastic as to where it's going. And um, there's plenty of information on the TerraCycle website. The customer services department is amazing. Um, so, you know, you, there is a bit more um, taking the, the manufacturers of these products um, into account. Um, and then the public can see and, and realise that there are different types of plastics and that they have to separate them before they bring them down, blah, blah, blah. Um, so for, for us, I think TerraCycle has, has been a good success and certainly a lot of people have been able to assess what they're buying and put it into um, the correct waste streams. Um, so, yeah, that's that's my thoughts on TerraCycle. <laughs> I, I, I've, got, I've got a slightly different view uh, about recycling. I mean, basically, recycling is really the last thing we, sh we should be doing. Right. So so uh, which I think you talked about as well, Dawn, that's why you highlighted reuse so much. And that's what you do on a daily basis. You know, it's, it's about reusing, remanufacturing and to be honest, avoiding waste in the first place. Right. Because once um, waste is produced, then, uh, you know, it, it, it has to be, you know, new energy has to be put in to do something with it. So we need to avoid it from happening in the first place. Yeah, so so. The recycling itself is really the last thing we should be doing. And, and so we really, that's why I emphasized in my little presentation, the need for redesigning entire economies and designing waste out of economic systems. And we are very, 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 very far away from that. You mentioned the mobile phones before. They are designed to fail. They're designed not to be repaired. They're designed to be thrown away after two or three years for the next model to come in. And it's just completely nuts. It's completely unsustainable. Uh, and, and that's just one example, right? So recycling is not the answer. We need to completely no, 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 recycling rethink. Is not the problem. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we agree on that, but but I think these discussions often immediately go into what can the council do about recycling? Should recycling become the law, or should it just you know how much uh, is being recycled, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. That that's really uh, uh, the discussion we should have uh, should have after we've done hundred other things before, uh, yes. and we need to start having these important discussions uh, about avoiding waste and reusing materials and remanufacturing in the first place. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that, again, that the public can do is, um, and that businesses can actually start up is a refill service um, uh, because that immediately cuts down on any um, uh, single use plastic being produced because you, you're refilling the bottles all the time. Um, and, you know, I remember as a small, as a, a child like like you, Stefan, you know, I do, I have got a memory from um, when things were different. And I remember going to places like Scoop and Save with my uh, grandparents and she bought everything there, my gran, um, from the flour to the dog food. Um, and these things are coming back again. So, it would be great to see more and more refill stores and people going back to thinking about um, less mass consumerism in the supermarket mm -hmm. and more individual choices and think really think about what you're buying where and what the knock-on effects of that item is that you're buying. Okay, Dawn, thanks very much for that. I think the next question is, uh, is more or less uh, pretty direct to uh, Stefan. 
Um, why am I constantly being asked to make sustainable choices, but I see no concrete action in terms of legislation and taxation that would ensure systemic change? So, Stefan, over to you. Yeah, yeah thank, you. thank you, Steve. I think, I think that's what I alluded to before, that you know, if, if we just um, rely on individuals to make these daily choices about what to buy and not to buy in the supermarkets or in the local corner shop, you know, we, we've tried, you know, we've tried this approach for the last 20, 30 years. You know, again, let me emphasize, we've been talking about climate change, you know, given that this is a climate change related event. We've been talking about these things for 30 years and yeah. there have been various things tried. And this kind of individual consumer choice approach has been tried for 30 years and it has failed. Right. So, of course, individuals are important to make the right choices. Of course, um, we have individual responsibility and we should all try our best to, to do the right thing at home, at work and in the community. But there is an, an amazing amount in anxiety uh, related to making the right choices all the time, right? And we often don't have the right information available to make these right choices. So there's a role for policymakers locally, regionally, and importantly, nationally, to have a level playing field for all businesses, for all communities, to, to basically doing the right thing. So, so there's, you know, in, in choice theory, sorry to be um, uh, talking from expert uh, theory, theoretical lines, but, you know, basically, if you reduce the choices and you only offer sustainable choices, so yes. economy choices, you're basically reducing anxiety for people and you pr provide a level playing field. So everybody can, you know, you can still choose, right? We're not living in a dictatorship, right? Uh, we shouldn't tell people exactly what to do, but you need to move the goalpost towards the greener end of the spectrum, right? And, and so we should have choice, but we need to have more sustainable choices rather than 100 choices. And then, uh, you know, we're all going crazy in the supermarkets, not knowing what to choose. So that, 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 that's been tried and it has failed. So there is a role for, for, for government because as the question says, we need really systemic change and we need it quickly. Well, here's a more practical question, actually, probably the last one we've got time for. Given the toxicity of um, waste electrical items, products, when roadside, uh, roadside recycling waste collection points be possible, that's a good idea, I think, uh, as opposed to having to travel to recycling centres. And many of the choices I make to buy sustainably um, have um, uh, to make the, yeah, is it far too late to make businesses make the same choices? Got a couple of questions mixed up there, but basically uh, when can roadside uh, we collection points be made available? Not just in Cornwall, but also the Isles of Scilly. Mm. Just, just a quick one. Um, uh, just before the event, um, um, Daniel, let me just see whether I pronounce that name correctly. Daniel Nima from the Isles of Scilly messaged me via LinkedIn, basically saying they've, uh, they've introduced a curbside uh, electrical waste uh, collection uh, service yeah. in, in the Isles of Scilly, which is fantastic. We absolutely need that. Um, because a lot of these electrical items literally just end up in a black bin at the moment, which, which is really unacceptable uh, mm -hmm. because a lot of tox toxic material is in there. Uh, and and uh, he's working with DEFRA and others to, to basically pilot this in the, uh, uh, on the Isles of Scilly, and hopefully we can see that soon. But again, that's just one first step, right? We really need to have different electrical materials uh, constructed, manufactured yeah, in a more repairable way in the first place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, we can't we can't just rely on on the recycling to solve these problems. Yes, that's that's very true. And in fact, uh, that waste collection scheme, uh, we use electrical vehicles to collect it. So it's a, a double whammy in, in a right. sense. And um, by the way, all the all the questions. I know we haven't got time to answer all these, but they will be collected and um, will be answered in in due course. I'm um, not sure if that's all, whether I can make one more question. Um, I'm not getting any messages from the producer at the moment. <laughs> but, 
But the key questions are, I mean, what can uh, the Cornwall Council and also the Isles of Scilly Council do to reduce all sorts of stuff, all sorts of problems? And, and we are. In fact, this afternoon, Tanya and I will be introducing our um, Climate Change Action Plan, which um, I'm sure both of you will be really interested in. So I think that's it for the moment. So I'd like to thank both of you very, very much. Um, and uh, hopefully, Dawn, um, I, I'm in Portreef next week, staying in Portreef. So oh, I, I, I'll look down, I'll, I'll go down and uh, introduce myself yes, yes, <laughs> in person yes. rather than electronically. Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Dawn. Nice to see you. Nice to thank see you, you again, Stefan. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.